Hello, welcome to English Buddhist terminology. Within the Four Noble Truths, when we discuss the final noble truth, which was the path that leads to the end of suffering, the Buddha mentioned the eight noble paths as a way for us to follow in order to guide ourselves towards the cessation of suffering. Therefore, we're going to use this session to look at the term the Eightfold Noble Path as a way for us to learn the possible solutions or directions which we can follow in guiding ourselves towards the end of suffering. In other words, the Noble Eightfold Path is something which will enable us to find happiness. And before we go on, let's go back to the Four Noble Truth and look at the path that leads to the end of suffering. And when we say that, we have to first think about what is the end of suffering. And in fact, let's go back a little bit more and ask ourselves, what is our suffering? And we can say that suffering is caused by our desire and clinging onto the phenomena of this world, which we regard as something that is substantial, but is in reality empty in nature. Therefore, once we discover what has caused our suffering, we need to think about ways for us to end this suffering. And the Buddha also taught us that the way for us to end our suffering is to relinquish what we take to be real, but is in fact false. In other words, as a way for us to end suffering, we need to regain the peaceful mind that will not be affected by the external phenomena in order to feel happiness. So the next question will be, what is happiness? What do you think happiness is? Some regard happiness as pleasant experiences. For example, the beautiful food, or a good movie that you had just been to, or when you have a family, it's happiness, or when that you're living sound and safe, it is happiness. In other words, we regard happiness as things which we eat, feel, here, see as good experiences. But some would also say that there's more than just pleasant experiences that can bring us happiness. For example, when we help other people, when we do something good, or when we work hard to gain what we truly want or deserve, it will bring us happiness. But if we were to go further, and to bring happiness to an even higher state of being, we can say that happiness means not owing anybody anything. For example, when you do not owe anybody any favors or money, of course, you will feel happy. But after all, you can have all of the above, yet you are still unhappy. Why is that? The reason of our happiness is because we expect happiness and that we long for happiness. And when we have such longings and desires, if they are not satisfied, then suffering is caused. For example, we long to be with the people whom we love forever. But if this person whom we love wants to break up with us, we will feel unhappy. When that the job that you are feeling satisfied with suddenly is not yours anymore. Suddenly your boss fires you. Then you will be unhappy. Or for all elder people. To them, happiness comes from having a complete or full family. But these children will have to grow up someday. Once they grow up, they will go out, find their own jobs, meet different people and make their own families. In other words, when they grow up, they will leave the family, leaving the parents with a, per with a question or a problem, an empty nest. Therefore, that loss of members in the family will cause unhappiness. 
Furthermore, if we were to overindulge ourselves in desires, if we pursue our desires or pursue happiness excessively and in incorrect ways, then there will be tragedy and regrets. Therefore, all of this tell us that the satisfaction of desires can only be temporary. And that temporary moment of happiness becomes something which we become attached to. And as we become attached to this temporary happiness, suffering will slowly start to rise for all of the above reasons. Therefore, the three categories of happiness which we have just talked about before cannot be considered real happiness. So pleasant experiences, uh, helping people, doing good things, working hard to gain what you truly deserve, and not owing anybody anything may be temporary happiness, but they are not real happiness. So what would be real happiness? This would be our next question. In Buddhism, it teaches us that lesser desires for material goods can lead us closer to happiness. A way for us to do this and a way for us to lessen our desires for material goods would be by giving or relinquishing your clingings. Therefore, you are no longer attached to certain objects or certain people. We slowly practice the act of giving and sharing in order to lessen our clingings and desires. This will also help us transcend worldly matters as we slowly discover that these material things can only offer us temporary happiness. After a while, it can no longer guarantee us happiness. And there's also the fact that these material objects are in fact empty in nature. Since they are empty in nature, they are not real. Therefore, you cannot depend on something unreal to, to give you happiness. But observing such natures in the material things that you see in this world, you will slowly learn to let go of such attachments and clingings. Now the key lies in learning to let go. Therefore, once you lessen your desires, you realize that there will be true happiness. And how do you lessen your desires? It is by letting go. What do you let go of? And how do you learn to let go? Let's answer the first part of the question. What we need to learn to let go of in this world is of our anger, of our hatred, of our greed, of our clinging, as well as our jealousy, arrogance, and doubts in order to achieve less than desires. And what we need to do as a way to let go of such feelings, which is not an easy thing to do, let me remind you. What we need to simply, what we need to do is to simply let these feelings pass without acting on them. For example, you see a piece of cake on the table. Then you observe your mind, you realize that some slowly greed arises in your mind because you like strawberry and that's a piece of strawberry cake. And imagine to yourself, what if you eat it? Even if you have eaten it, that satisfaction will slowly go away. And when you get hungry again, you will be, once again, unhappy. Or that you simply observe your mind. Am I desiring that piece of cake just because I like strawberry? But I'm not hungry at all. I don't need it. Or... Would I be angry if I don't get that piece of cake? Or am I just being greedy for that piece of cake? So you slowly observe all of these kinds of thoughts which may arise in your mind. You become clearer of their true nature. You become clearer of the fact that they're simply a, a type of response that you have upon seeing that piece of strawberry cake. But there's no need to act upon it because it could only lead to further unfulfilled desires. Therefore, once you're able to do that, you will be able to have a mind that is clearer, more joyful and peaceful. This is what learning to let go is about. 
And now a third way for us to gain true happiness is to ser- or pursue or search for that joy which is gained from meditating. When we meditate, our mind abides in joy. As our mind explores the truth of this universe, it slowly becomes joyful for realizing the many facts we have discussed in Buddhism. And as our mind abides in joy, then suffering will no longer arise within. This is what happens during meditation. But then we also realize that we cannot remain in meditation all the time. Therefore, eventually this type of joy in meditation will have to end somehow. Once it ends, your happiness ends. Therefore, we need to go further, take one step further into searching for real happiness. And finally, ultimate happiness will be found in enlightenment, which is a state where all defilements are severed. An enlightened mind becomes fully aware of dependent origination, of causes and conditions, of cause and effect, and of the fact that every phenomena in this world are empty in nature. Once you remain aware of such thoughts, your mind will no longer respond blindly to the worldly phenomena which you see, hear, feel, or experience, then that state of enlightenment will give you true happiness. But nonetheless, no matter which kind of happiness we are pursuing at this stage, we have to realize that we still have to follow a particular path, which is the Eightfold Noble Path. Now let's look at the term the Noble Eightfold Path. Just like the Four Noble Truths, it contains the word noble. And in this case, we will explain the word noble as what is correct and won't lead to evil. Therefore, it's a path that will definitely guide you to righteousness and enlightenment. While the word path means direction toward liberation and enlightenment. As for eightfold, we can see that this path consists of eight very important contents or elements. And as we talk about the path that leads to righteousness, we will see that righteousness is very, very important. Once a student of Confucius, Zheng Zhi, passed away. But after he passed away, as his family was so poor, his wife couldn't even afford a piece of cloth that could cover him up properly. If you were to cover up his face, then his feet would be exposed. And if you were to pull that piece of cloth downwards, then to cover his feet, then his face would be exposed. Therefore, somebody suggested that his wife turn the piece of cloth diagonally. And that way, the corners would be able to cover both his face and feet. But Zheng Zhi's wife answered, My husband was an upright person. He would rather be insufficient yet upright, than to be sufficient yet unrighteous. This demonstrates the importance of staying on the right paths in life. And in Buddhism, this can be well represented by the Noble Eightfold Path, following the right directions that would lead you to the right destination. As we look at the Eightfold Noble Path, once we've said that they consist of eight elements, they all actually come into one. So there are eight parts of one very important path. And we can even say that they follow one another. But, no matter what we do in life, We can even say that all ways of practice cannot be done without the Noble Eightfold Paths. They may look simple, but they could contain profound meanings.